Like, I want to be part of the process. I want to be the first one here and the last one to leave. Like, I want to be able to touch everything, talk to everybody. I want, I want, I want all this like creative like anxiety to be able to spill out. And you know, when you're just there to like, you know, play your part, like I realize, you know, it's the the monster starts to come out, the jaded old dude that's just like pissed off and in the corner smoking, going, "When are we rapping, man?" You know. And I don't want to be that guy. That guy is not good to be around, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Agin. So, he, yeah, he, I was in Vancouver, and Brian was like, hey, this festival in Canada wants to screen your movie. It's like two hours by plane. I said, like, let's go. And then we got there. I was like, what is this town? <laughs> There's nothing. Nothing. Yeah, but, but it, was, it was so beautiful because... You ever seen that movie, The Majestic, with Jim Carrey? Yeah, yeah. If this theater was a time capsule, yeah. and everybody, okay. thank you, this everybody in town came, and they were like dressed up. Yeah. I mean, the theater hadn't changed like since I think it was built, right? And I mean, that is like the true like cinema experience, right? Yeah. And then you, you just you, you're, I was like, this is all worth it because you question because. You know, I, 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 I've had multiple films that like Sundance and TIFF and the bigger ones. And, you know, this film was never designed for that. And I thought, you know, what did I do? Why did I do this? I should have done a narrative that fit into that type of category. But, you know, when I got to share this movie, even at the two festivals that I attended, and you see how sincere people are about what the film represents and the message, and their love affair for the horror genre, like you know, that's why they're coming out to celebrate their love affair for practical effects. Um, it's something. It was you know, I, I I go, it was all worth it, man. You know, if it, even if it's a small movie and it doesn't, you know, it's not as big as like the fast movies and stuff, and it doesn't get these awards yeah. accolades. But at every festival, we won like best like you know film, like you know, jury prize, and we won like you know audience award. So. It was it's really amazing, you know, that this little movie that is rejected really by mainstream Hollywood, you know, um, has such this sincere following or support, you know. So, yeah, yeah this is, so, I mean, it redefined what I think of and, you know, my future participation in the smaller film festivals. Like, I want to go... And it's like, I want to keep supporting these film festivals because they're there for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. They're not there to go to the party and get swag and see movie stars because movie stars don't show up to that. So when an actor they see and, you know, like, you know, they love the Fast franchise, they see and you're approachable and you're there talking about a film that, you know, that they, they, they it, it, especially they love that genre. It's like you find your tribe, you know, so it was a great experience, great experience. So the, the, the horror genre fans are your tribe, or the film pure the film purists fans are your are your tribe? Is what? I think a combination of both, but I think it's film. I mean, it's it's uh, horror genre centric. I mean, it leans towards that, and it. I mean, because the whole design of Shaky Shivers, when I talked to you know Andy McAllister and Aaron Strong, any of the writers, Aaron at that time when he wrote the script, he had a eight, nine-year-old daughter, and he wanted to share his love affair for practical effects from the 70s and 80s and early 90s, but they didn't want to scare the bejesus out of her, so he created this wonderful journey of these two doofuses going on this, you know, and, and this, this, this journey in, this, in, in the world of monsters, right? So um, that brings in all of the, you know, horror genre lovers, and you know, when we discuss, like, you know, what is, like, you know, hopefully what is our demographic? And I hope it's, and, I, and, and it, 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 it actually is now, that um, it's the people who love that era of practical effects and horror films, but they want to watch a movie with their kids, like on a Sunday evening, and they don't want to scare them, right? So that's really what the design of this film was, um, and the ethos. So that's pretty much the majority of our, you know, uh, our demographic. I knew that if I tackled that personal passion project, you know, as my first film, I didn't. I, didn't, I know that I couldn't execute it. In hindsight, I think back because I have the film that I'm going to direct next, and it's a very personal story 
um, about my family growing up in the South. And there's no way I could have done that. Because, you know, a director needs certain tools in his box, right? And, of course, as an actor, I've gotten to participate in pre-production and, of course, physical production. But the post-production aspect of it is something that was a foreign language to me. So to be able to go into that process and then also build your team to build your army for future projects and then learn what to do and especially what not to do. That's really what I learned on Shaky Shivers is in, for the next film, what not to do, you know? Because um, the pragmatics of filmmaking is actually pretty easy. As a director, the hardest job is hiring, finding people that are just smarter than me and better <laughs> at their department than me. And then you put them together and it's like Voltron and, you know, and then, you know, everybody does their thing and, you know, and, and they're, you know, I, I'm there to really just set tone, right? Um, but post-production for me was so foreign to me, and now I understand it. And also, I needed to see if I had the stamina as a director, you know, because, you know, I read that, you know, they're, you know, even the most prolific directors, they have maybe six to ten movies in their whole career. An actor could do hundreds, hundreds of projects. You can do small TV, co-star, guest star, multiple films throughout the year. Um, and that's really, I, I realized when people said, you know, you know, many times, you know, an actor turned director, for some reason it really works, especially if they're ready and they have a underlining, like, real purpose on why they want to move into directing. Mm -hmm. And I've got the opportunity to work with so many, like, great directors in our town. So, you know, and I, so I, I've been able to take, like, you know, like the best of them and put it into my box and now apply it. Um, and... You know, you got to get over the nerves too. Like your first time, you're really nervous because you're like, you know, you're questioning yourself every day. You can't sleep. You're like, do I know what I'm doing? You know, and 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 then after you see the movie in the theater and you hear the laughs and you hear the reactions, you go, sure. I wish I had more time and more resources, right? I know I could do it better the next time, but you just got to cut your teeth and you got to fall down. You got to get up and. That was really the most important thing for me is like, will I be able to dust it off, you know, and look at my mistakes and get up and go, okay, let's do it again, right? So I'm ready. I'm, I'm completely ready. And, and now that, you know, I, I also realized that, you know, the currency and the strength of having a personal story that every day you're going to wake up and really fight for, you know, and it's th that's why with Shaggy Shivers, I realized because I didn't write it, I learned from that I don't want to do another project where I did not actually create it from bottom up because think filmmaking is so difficult to have that stamina to the very end. You have to have like this purpose behind it. Mm -hmm. And then even talking about it, you know, like there's sincerity when it's actually, it's yours, opposed to, hey, I did a movie, and it's great, and it's this, this, and I, I did this, and eh. people The camera doesn't lie, right? You know, right? So, yeah. Um, okay, so it, you have that script written for mm -hmm. the next thing, and, yeah. you're, and you're ready for it. Okay, yeah. good, good, awesome. And it's about your childhood. My childhood your, uh, in Georgia, um, growing up in a biracial family. Um, and it leans towards comedy, and I think the world is ready now. I, you know, so many Asian or Asian American stories have, I think, set precedent and desensitized, you know, especially the domestic audience. Um, and I feel like, you know, this is my superpower. This is what makes me unique as an Asian American filmmaker. You know, I think if I came from, you know, just a normal Korean American family, you know, it's maybe it's stories that you've seen already and, you know, something that created so much trauma in our family to be, you know, dealing with, you know, racism in our family because we have, you know, my sister's half African American, my dad is African American, He's, he was part of the civil rights movement, and then my mother being a Korean immigrant. There's actually, I think that perspective and that story has never been told. But I want to use comedy to access the, you know, the the issues we went through during, you know, you know during the '70s and '80s, growing up in the Deep South, you know, and um, 
And a lesson I learned from you know Shaky Shivers is like you, you can tackle things, and it's more accessible if we're all laughing at it together, right? Opposed to being on a soapbox and going, "I'm a victim," you know. I think I'm just older, and I don't want to do those type of films anymore. So, you know, it's evolved, and finally, I, f I feel like I understand the tone and how to present it. And I think the world is ready, you know. Well, two directors specifically is um, Walter Hill. I got to work with. Uh, living legend Walter Hill. Um, you know, he did 48 Hours, he worked with Peckinpah, he, um, he, he did uh, Brewster's Millions, which was one of my favorite films, right, ever. Uh, underrated film, I love that film, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, you know, when I got to work with uh, uh, Mr. Hill, you know, his approach of how, what tone he set on, you know, on the movie set, you know, I realize it, you know, everything comes from the top. And he taught me this. He said, you know, his job is to, again, hire people that are smarter and better at the departments than he is. And then, you know, his job is easy. He can sit back and just call action, right? Um, but he had such a warmth about him. And he didn't approach it like people work for him and this is his movie. It was really a truly a collaboration. And, you know... Working with such a legend like that, you know, I walked in and Sylvester Stallone was in the film, so I'm playing opposite of him. So there you go, you got these legends, right, in, in the industry. And, you know, of course, you come in nervous, but, you know, if there was just this mutual, there was this automatic respect, like, given to me, right? And if I'm ready to, you know, take a bullet for the movie, you know, and, and you know, and jump in and be prepared, um, you know, he treated me with equal respect, and so this was, it was a it's, you know this tone setting that I really appreciated about him. It's like, even though a million things are going in his mind, he always was very zen about everything, right? And so I realized it's like having par you know your parents. If your parents are all like neurotic and they're full of anxiety, it's going to trickle down. So I'm like, I right, remember when things are hitting the fan, like. Just slow everything down and relax, right? And he would always tell me, it's just a movie. It's just a movie, right? And then I got to work with Robert Rodriguez in Austin at his studio. And he is an open book of information. And I remember I was asking him, you know, in between takes, I was like, hey, do you remember that scene in El Mariachi? How did you do that? How much did that cost? And he just pops open his, you know, his, his MacBook. It just starts to pull out things, and it's, everything is, all information is accessible. And I never worked with a director like that. He's like, you want to see my storyboards? You want to see the, the original script? What do you want to see? What do you want to see? You want to see the previs? And then um, he invited us to his home, the cast to his home, and the concept of service to him is so important that, you know, even though he is the leader of, of, this, of this band, if you will, of this team of misfits, he was there and he was, he was cooking for us, he was serving us. And it was interesting because that made him very accessible to us. And then the appreciation of everybody that was working for him as an artist. He had this room, this little den. And he said, you know, could you honor us with something in my book? And there's it's like this leather bound book. It looks like it came out of like Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter. And I'm like flipping through it and there's like Obama there's Oprah Winfrey, there's Lady Gaga, and, you know, and people either draw or they write something. And, you know, I, I drew this flower, and, you know, I, I like to draw flowers. You know, um, it's like it's something that, that calms me down. And, you know, I was like, why does he do this? You know, it's like, could you contribute, you know, a piece of your art to us, the words he used? And I was like, instantly you feel, hey, you know, I'm appreciated. Like, you see me as an artist, not just an actor to service your vision, right? And so, you know, this Zen quality of Walter Hill and this open bookness of Robert Rodriguez. And so when I did Shaky, you know, I, had, you know, I have my director's Bible, and I would spend the time and share everything. Because if they're in my head, you know, it makes every department's job much easier. And then we get this unified look, get this unified vision. Right, so I've all, you know I always to this day I you know I'm so grateful to them. And so you know in the end credits I, there's like special things and of course their names are up there.
you, you talked about sort of like the not, you know, uh, being too nervous about everything and stuff, your image is such that, I mean, and, and you know, I guess mostly from fast, but of just like, you're so chill, but are you, do you, are you not, is that not true in real life? That like, no, 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 so, I'm so, I'm so insecure, so like anxious all yeah. the time. And as I get, old, I get older, right, it's, it, you know, I think I'm calming down, but, you know, I was hyper, I was like, you know, I was the kid that relatives did not want them need to come over to their house, you know, because I'm always, and I'm clumsy, so I'd like break everything. When I talk, I use my hands, so I'm like knocking over everything, and, um, and I'm, you know, my mind's going like a million hour, you know, miles an hour, right? So um, I've learned to like just calm down and like live in the moment, you know? It's like when someone's anxious, you're like thinking about like, you know, the next thing, so trying to do less of that, but it's hard, you know? And, and maybe that's why I became an actor or, you know, I went into the arts, is right, right? It's like, you know, that sometimes that ADD kind of serves you a little bit, Absolutely, right? Yeah. right? I mean, because, you know, as an actor, you're taught to, it's all about relaxation, right? And, but you got to constantly be thinking, like, what you're going to do or get from, you know? And, and, I th and with Han, you know, you, the, you know, if you really break it down, Han barely talks throughout any, any of the movies, right? So... There has to, there always had to be some type of activity so that you know that ADD kind of served. It's like, well, let me snack on something, you know, and then you can use it as a prop to actually act, you know, because I realize I'm not say, I'm not talking much in this movie, but you know, if I can, you know, show disgust with the way I eat or I throw away or discard the chip or you know, or I'm questioning by the way I'm chewing, right? So, yeah, I guess that helps a little. <laughs> and did you uh, and were, did you find yourself able to sort of reach that sort of uh, calm zen place when when actually filming this or in filming what shaking? No. <laughs> oh my god! I was like outside, like chain smoking. Like you know, smoking is like the worst habit to pick up. And I was out there, like you know, like chain smoking because there's a million things you have to think about as an actor. You have to, I have to you know be ten steps ahead of everybody and go. All right, we got our next shot. We got our next setup, and then you know, time is your enemy. So you're always looking, you know. And I think, I think, you know, on the next film, it probably won't be any different. I mean, I, I mean, yeah. I mean, because time is your enemy, you know, on, on a movie set, right? So it doesn't matter if you have fifty cents like we did, or two hundred, four hundred million dollars like a Fast and Furious movie. Still, time is your enemy. You only have so much, many hours in the day to get those shots, right? And um, I don't think an actor, I mean, directors, until they're like Walter Hill's age or, you know, you have a filmography where you're like, I have nothing to prove anymore, right? I think, I think most directors have to, I think they're, they're full of anxiety, you know? Yeah, you know, this is something I learned from Justin Lin. You know, he, what I really appreciate about working with him as a director, and I think that's why, you know, the crew members always loved and appreciated working with Justin. Even on you know the small movies like Better Luck Tomorrow, we started on to the fast. Is that he used this phrase instead of "Hey, can you do this or do this?" It was "Hey, Ryan, could you uh, could you help us out?" Right? And it, so even even you know so just the just those words, it's 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 a much much gentler approach and then it feels very inclusive opposed to do mm -hmm. right and so that's something that i r repeated and i borrowed from justin is and i'm and you know i'm asking everybody can you help me out <laughs> can you help, hey, can you do me a favor can you, can, can you help me out uh can you show up <laughs> can you do me a favor right yeah so. i think as a kid i always was fascinated with the concept of being a director right but I did not go to film school, and something, you know, led me to be an actor first. And I think it was, I had to get rid of, first of all, you know, everything in the world being about me, and then insecurities, and, you know, as a 50-year-old man now, I think I have most of that stuff figured out, right? And I don't know if it was five years ago, but, you know, even back to when I started, yes, things are, I think, better right? Um, but for myself, I'm just speaking for myself, right? I don't have opportunities. I don't have those opportunities where I feel like I can spread my wings as an actor. Um, yes, I work, 
right? And I make a good living. I'm able to take care of, you know, my family. Um, and I get to participate in some gigantic movies, but I stand back, especially, you know, these days. I, I'm on set and I'm going, man, I, I, I'm, I feel like I'm on the bench all the time, right? And you can't demand change. It doesn't work like that, right? But... I feel like now, and five years ago, ten years ago, fifteen years ago, I, I don't, I, you know, I, it was always there. It was like, I hope I can find a real sincere reason of why I need to get behind the camera as a director, and I know the answer now because it's no longer about me. It's like, maybe this is not my journey to go win an Oscar as an actor. Maybe those opportunities will never come. And a post, uh, instead of like waiting around and being jaded about it and losing the light behind my eyes, you know, I can create those opportunities for other actors that may never have had that opportunity or may never. And so that excites me. So you know, it's like to be able to let you know, everything about being you go and go, oh, I can go behind the camera, first tell these amazing stories that are part of me, they're unique to me, but I can give these actors opportunity, the marginalized, or it, you know, it doesn't matter what color you are. Being an actor is hard. So just when you know you get to work with actors and you give them these opportunities where they're able to spread their wings and they play a full range within that character. You, I mean, th th that's what the actors eat up, and and I feel like okay, this is what I want to do now. And you know, working with all these direct, these amazing directors in my career as an actor, like. I think I now can pay that forward, you know? So, That's great. Yeah. 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 Were, you, were you starting to feel the light, light go out behind your eyes? Is that what After I started directing, because it was dimming, yeah. you know, it was like, it was hard to like wake up. And then, you know, you just all these complaints are coming out of my mouth. Like, you know, you're on a big Hollywood movie and you're just like, the food sucks. Like, you know, why is call time so early? You know, it's like, when do I get out of here? And that's when you're in trouble, right? And as an actor, I start to feel that way. And I mean, you know, I, I still work as an actor and, you know, some are super exciting because, you know, like I can, you know, the environment or the director or the team or the material allows me to be on set from the second I get there. And then there are some movies where you're in your trailer for two hours or three hours and that's when I start going crazy. I'm like, what am I doing here? Like, I want to be part of the process. I want to be the first one here and the last one to leave. Like. I want to be able to touch everything, talk to everybody. I want, I want, I want all this like creative like anxiety to be able to spill out. And you know, when you're just there to like you know play your part, like I realize, you know, it's the the monster starts to come out, the jaded old dude that's just like pissed off and in the corner smoking, going, "What are we rapping, man?" You know, and I don't want to be that guy. That guy is not good to be around. You know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, well, first of all, I have to be, I'm so grateful to our union, you know, uh, when times were tough, my wife um, got cancer, right? And if we did not have, first of all, the medical insurance that SAG provided, and if I did not have the residuals that came from all the little jobs I had done previously, we would have never qualified that year, because you have to make... I think the number is like thirty-one to thirty-three thousand a year, right, to qualify for SAG insurance to get the full coverage. And if we did not have that, first of all, we couldn't afford it. And she may probably wouldn't be around here right now, and I would not be because I would have fucking went crazy, right? Um, and so that specific issue, right, in terms of what our union is fighting for in the strike, is so personal to me. So. You know, whatever they need from me, I'm there, right? Because they literally saved my wife's life. Um, but then also, I also understand, like, you know, I always felt like this union was always on our side, all the time, right? So when even other actors are, like, complaining or they're, they're not complaining, but they're frustrated with the situation because, you know, work has stopped. You know, there's these interim agreements. I mean, I've, I did a film recently in... You know, Asia, that you know there were multiple SAG actors in there, so we got the interim agreement, and then we were able to go shoot this movie, and and so that actually 
you know, like it was refreshing because I'm like, oh, they don't, it's not like our union wants us to starve and stop working. But as long as the producers and the production company, they agree with this interim agreement and whatever future like resolutions happen, they will follow suit. You know, we're set to go, right? And it also, you know, was cool because it made me realize that not every producer out there is our enemy. Right, because you have these independent like producers, like, hey man, I, I need you guys to win too. I need you guys to be happy, right? So, you know, fortunately, somehow I, you know, got that job. And even for the film that you know is premiering, you know, tomorrow. I mean, that's coming out in theaters tomorrow that I directed. You know, we would have loved and we needed the actors to be able to promote the movie. So we applied for the interim agreement so they could do it, and SAG gave it to us, right? So. I'm like, hey, you, you just follow the rules and you ask and you, you do what we need to do under the regulations of SAG. And we're moving, you know? you know? And I have a non-scripted project, right, like a docu-series. And, you know, we went and applied with SAG to get the signatory. And it's like, you know, so you're, we're st I'm still able to, you know, continue to work and be creative. But I can see and feel in town like it's strangling now. Like... I, you know, when I, I went to like a restaurant that it, my wife and I frequent, and it was empty. And you know, the owner, Masasan, the sushi place. He's, has, I was like, how, how is it empty on a Friday night? He's like, I don't know. I think it's because he had a lot of people from Hollywood, mm -hmm. like you know, you know, work from crew members to, to actors to producer to, to writers, right? Sure. And so you see it strangling, right? So, um, so we need to resolve this soon. You know, I, I I don't you know I hear, I I heard Labor Day I heard, you know I heard I hear Thanksgiving I hear, you know, Christmas I hear January I don't, I don't know man but we just got to keep going right. I, would, I wonder if the, is the AI thing and uh, a big deal for you like as somebody who's like likeness is used on rides and things like that like is, is that something you you think about like. Or is that just kind of like? Uh, I don't, I don't no, I, it needs to it stop, right? This, I, 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 I mean, it's already bad. Like you know, they it's it's not like I get paid every time you see my picture on a ride or on a toy, on a figurine or whatever. You know, I, it's, I, I don't get paid. So they, you know, even that, like contractually, it's like I get boned anyway, right? Because they own the image, they own the character's image, and they, in perpetuity, they can keep selling like you know toys and product. I don't get any of that. Right, so then if we move into AI, they can actually now start using me to put into movies and and create my voice and my movements. Uh, come on, come on, that's too much. You're already getting boned anyway. Like, come on, that 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 that's like, why don't you just strip me naked totally and throw me in the water, man? You know, so <laughs> uh, only it's called only in America, and it's uh, it takes place when I'm like 12, 13, right? Um, and so I have actors in mind, but I, I, I'd like to keep the movie uh, like around like 1.5 million, right? Um, and go back to Georgia and shoot it. So at that budget, I don't know who, you know, what names are actually going to be able to like attach. And I don't need it, I, you know, because I feel like it's this, this, this new, I guess, unseen perspective, right? I feel like if you have recognized actors in that, you know, they'll actually kind of like it'll it, it'll you know detract from like what I'm actually trying to say, right? Um, I don't want anything familiar, so you know. But I think there's going to be a business side to this movie, so if, you know, all of a sudden Denzel Washington saying, oh, "I'll play your dad," I, I don't know. I thought you know, I'll, I'll consider it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but so cool that you know Vivi, like she said, she was in college, so she was interning at East West, and you know she, she had aspirations to be an actress. And then again, as a director, you know, to be able to participate in people's like Hollywood dreams, right? And like you know, she she every time I see her, her and her boyfriend, it's always like thanking me, and I go. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I go. Thank you for what? I should be thanking you, you know. And, and I and I when I when I talk to her and, and her boyfriend, 
you know, they say, you know, the lack of opportunities for her to spread her wings as an actress, right? She gets, she gets work, but it's like, again, it's like very one-dimensional. And, you know, she doesn't have to explain that to me. You know, as an Asian-American actress, I know her struggles. So there's a shorthand that she doesn't have to come in and ask for things like, I'm going to give her the full play because I know she's only used to side dishes. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Uh, because I would want that. I would love to have that as an actor, you know. So, it's it's great to be a part of that, you know. Yeah. Um, going back to when you were sort of talking about the opportunities, were you sort of trying out for or auditioning for the sort of like a colorblind role where they would be like, it could be anybody, and you were just not getting it, or were you? What was the what were the specifics sort of about that for you? Uh, they was, I, mean, I, th I think they say that these are colorblind like roles in the breakdown but then you read it and you're like mm, nah, that's that's that there's no way they're gonna cast me right um and also you know there's a i think you know somebody a friend told me i was like man it's just not working with me it's like i don't know what's wrong with me like do i suck as an actor it's like is it my face like is it my energy it's like what am I doing wrong? And he, he articulated it in this way, and I don't know if this is true, but he said, you know, you're a leading man type, right? So there's no, that's, that's a character that doesn't exist in Hollywood for you. When you go to Asia, sure, there's, multi, there's always going to be opportunities for you. But here, you, aren't, there is, you, are, you can't be the leading man, right? Because it's, how is that going to work, right? Because it's, it's a businessman, Right, and your energy is not like you know supporting guy, right? You know, it's like there is a like you know he's like you walk into a room and it's like you know it is kind of intimidating because you're not you know, people can't just laugh at you, right? And you're a funny guy and you know you're nice and all, but when you walk into a room like you know you're you're big, you're tall, your face is not like hey come and laugh at me. So where are they gonna put you in Hollywood, man? And it hit me and I was like that really sucks. Right, and then you look at the landscape, and you go, yeah, where do I actually fit in, right? And you know, it's so I, I, I don't know. I mean, they say colorblind, and, and maybe you know my audition sucked, or you know, as a director, I also it's taught me to take take things less personal because it like it's so hard to find the right actor for that particular role, right, in your project. Then if you care. That role and the actor is going to fit like a tailored suit. Yeah, many actors can come in. And I can say, hey man, I could I can play Batman, but it, that suit has to be tailor fit to me and that vision from that director. And that's his right. You know, it's like, you know, will they see an Asian American person play that? And even if they do, well, now the business side of show business, the powers that be or the studio allow that to happen, right? You know, there are these comps and. You know, they, you, they evaluate like an actor's, you know, like worth throughout the markets and stuff. So, you know, the more you learn, right, you realize like, okay, it's not necessarily just about you and, you know, you didn't do anything wrong, but there's a big business side of it. I mean, when, when we were shooting, or after Better Luck Tomorrow, this producer, I think he was, he was at Paramount and he said, you know, the question posed of like, you know, you know, I think we asked him, it's like, you know, is there, like, what do you think about racism within, you know, Hollywood? And, he's, and he's, he was very blunt. He's like, you know, I don't see any color. Like, you could be blue, you know, orange. All I care about is the color green. It's like, if you can make me money, then you're going to be the star of the film. And then breaking it down to stats is like, it's only 5% of the United States at that time that was Asian. So 5%, right? So that's why there aren't Asian movie stars, Asian American movie stars, because we don't have the population to go demand that. African Americans have their Denzels and Will Smith because they have enough population to support the Tyler Perrys. They, they, they're going to go and support you know, af, you know, African American filmmakers and stories. You know, that 5% in Asia, the Asian population is divided too. Like, you know, my mother never watches American like TV shows she's gonna go rent that stuff from Korea you know the K-dramas and stuff so so then you know then you have the Chinese community 
You have the Vietnamese community. So every, Philippine, so everything's kind of dispersed. So, you know, it's, it's, I think this generation now, that's, and then also internet has changed where it has become very global, right? Um, and so I, that's a long answer to your question. It's like, I don't know what the answer is, you know? It's like, and I don't want to stand on this r like racial soapbox and go, it's, you know, it's like Hollywood is racist. Is it? Or is it business, right? And maybe my face or who I am doesn't make them money at the end of the day, right? But, you know, that's why, you know, I think FAST has, like, actually, you know, changed the discussion as well because, you know, Han is such a beloved character, right? And globally, it's accepted. You know, he's beloved, like, you know, he's beloved in America. He's beloved everywhere, right? So I think being a part of that has given me more hope Right for the future, but you know maybe again I have to go behind the camera and create more opportunities, more Hans, right? So. Awesome. Yeah, long answer. I'm sorry, Brian. No, no, but, I, yeah, I, I love it. I, I thank you for all your, uh, your openness. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, I think that's it. Uh, do you think we can get like a, a Fast and Furious cast on the picket lines at some point? Like, will, they, will everybody gather together? <laughs> Do a, do a picket line we should. Yeah. I mean, whoever is based in LA, I know Jordan is here, Michelle. I know they, they'd be down for it, but you know, I don't. Some some folks, some folks are just all over the country. Um, we should though, huh? Pull up in some cars and yeah, that would be great. I, actually, that's a great idea. I think I'm gonna call everybody. We, we should do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's end this strike fast and furious. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.